Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Deverna. I'm a PhD candidate here at IU. Um, I'm really happy to welcome everybody to the Observatory on Social Media's Awesome Speakers event. Uh, and as we usually do, I'll do a little, a quick introduction of uh, the Observatory on Social Media and the event in general, and then I'll introduce our awesome speaker for the day. Uh, and we'll get started. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Observatory on Social Media, we are a, uh, the Observatory on Social Media is a joint project of the Luddy School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering and the Media School at Indiana University. Um, and really the Observatory is meant to be uh, an interdisciplinary research uh, group, which is interested in all the things at the intersection of technology um, and in particular social media. Um, we develop tools and do rigorous uh, research um, and work to develop and, and train the next, uh, you know, uh, set of media professionals and computationally skilled researchers. Um, the uh, Awesome Speakers event is, uh, aims to provide a platform for leading scholars and researchers to share their work and insights about social media manipulation and misinformation. And we're hoping to bring together the best uh, and brightest scholars who are working in this area. And if you're interested in learning more about future events or, or past events, you can check out the events page that we have here uh, listed below um, to learn more about that. And it's really my honor to introduce David Bronyatowski, who is a, uh, an assistant associate professor at George Washington University. Uh, and David, I hope you'll forgive me for a sort of briefer introduction than I was planning, because I don't have my notes in front of me, but I'll let you um, talk a little bit more about yourself when you get a chance to speak. And um, before we uh, pass the mic off to you, um, I'll just sort of remind everybody of the structure. So David will give a presentation for about 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll open up the floor for uh, 15 minutes uh, of, dis of discussion and questions. Uh, so you can please you know, drop your questions in the chat throughout the talk. Um, or just save them for later, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll have some in interesting discussion. And with that, I'll stop sharing, and please welcome David uh, as he sets up his presentation. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you all for, um, for coming, and thanks for uh, your attention. Um, my name is David Breniotowski. I am uh, an associate professor in the Department of Engineering Management and Systems Engineering uh, at GW. It's truly a pleasure to be here. I uh, really am a big fan of the work that you all do uh, at uh, IU and the work that uh, Awesome does is pretty awesome. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to be able to present uh, to this group. Um, this is a really interdisciplinary collaboration uh, on this particular paper, uh, and I will give you the punchline up front because I think that what we are, uh, uh, what we're really trying to do in this in this paper in this work is to emphasize the role of the built environment or a systems architecture. Uh, which is something in uh, the spread of misinformation that I think has been uh, reasonably understudied. Um, now, of course, speaking as a systems engineer, a little bit parochially here, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I am, am very interested in uh, and that I would like to make the case we should perhaps all be a little bit interested in is uh, the ways in which the platform, uh, the explicit macro design of the platform can drive the ability of that platform uh, to be able to carry out policies uh, that have to do with uh, with misinformation and, and disinformation. Uh, we can, of course, have a reasonable debate about whether or not the platforms should be carrying out those policies. But what I want to do here is put that debate aside for the moment. And I want to say, a platform has committed to carrying out a policy. In this particular case, Facebook had a specific policy about removing COVID-19 misinformation during the pandemic. And the simple question is, given that this is their policy, does the platform allow them to carry it out? Uh, so the name of the talk here is the efficacy of Facebook's misinformation policies and architecture during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so the agenda for today is to sort of motivate why it is we even care about uh, misinformation uh, and uh, to look at specific different types of remedies. Uh, in particular, uh, Facebook was uh, one of the first platforms out there to use what has been called a hard remedy, which is to say content removal and deplatforming at a large scale. 
Uh, and we want to know, do these work and did they work on Facebook? Um, so we examined whether this policy was effective. Um, and so again, getting sort of straight to the punchline here, what we found was that although Facebook was highly successful in removing a large number of anti-vaccine posts, there were also several perverse effects. Uh, several pro-vaccine posts were also removed. Uh, importantly, engagement with the remaining anti-vaccine content uh, repeatedly recovered to pre-policy levels and was not actually detectably different from what happened before the policy. Uh, and furthermore, the content that remained became more misinformative by multiple measures, more politically polarized on both sides of the political spectrum, uh, and more likely to be seen in users' news feeds. And so the argument that I'm going to make here is that this is an unintended consequence of Facebook's primary design goal, which is promoting community formation. And if you should question whether that's uh, Facebook's primary design goal, look at their mission statement, uh, which explicitly says something uh, along those uh, along those lines. Um, and so the argument here is that uh, the architecture of a social media platform, which is something that has been, I would argue, uh, up until this point, reasonably understudied, uh, actually facilitates community formation and mobilization uh, around specific topics. And so uh, this has implications for the ways in which we need to think through how we go about uh, evaluating what platforms do and how we th should think as researchers about characterizing different social media platforms uh, and perhaps even ways that one might think about governing the social media space because governance of social media platforms is, is now something that I think is pretty universally recognized uh, as something that needs to happen in some way. Uh, and so I'm going to make the case here that rather than thinking through governing content as the only lever for how to uh, for how to think through governing platforms. We can also think about these as designed infrastructures. And as designed infrastructures, uh, one way that we think through governing other infrastructures is by establishing building codes. If we have a strong sense of the architecture of a platform, then we can think through how do building codes apply to that architecture. So that's the main argument I'm going to make today. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'll sort of jump into it. Uh, we, uh, I think, now are at a point where it's reasonably well uh, well accepted that online misinformation uh, can be problematic. Uh, it's widely believed to undermine trust in scientific evidence and medical recommendations, and there's literature linking it to several harmful offline behaviors, including stalled public health efforts, civil unrest, uh, and, and, and in some cases, perhaps even mass violence. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic in particular put this on a lot of people's radar by spurring widespread concern that misinformation on social media may have actually led to lowered vaccine uptake rates. Uh, and again, pointing to some, some excellent work that's been done by, by, by IU in this space, uh, we certainly see very strong uh, correlational evidence uh, and, and associative evidence in this case. And there's even some, uh, some experimental evidence that suggests that this may be true. Uh, and so uh, given this context, we've seen policymakers put significant pressure on platforms, on social media platforms, to control COVID misinformation. Uh, and of course, this has been quite controversial. Uh, this pressure was put not just on Facebook, as we'll study here, but on several platforms as well, uh, including Twitter and, and YouTube. Uh, and several of these platforms took action uh, concurrently with this uh, with this external pressure. Uh, now, until late 2020, Facebook famously did not want to be the so-called arbiters of truth. Um, and Facebook favored what uh, has been called soft interventions in the literature. And soft interventions include things like accuracy nudges, where uh, this is the work of, of Dave Rand and, and Gordon Pennycook. Uh, I believe uh, I believe Dave Rand is scheduled to speak next week, um, you know, where, where you're not actually telling people what to do uh, or you're not removing content, you're simply nudging people to be more accurate. Uh, or perhaps things like warning labels. This is a, a page that discusses vaccines without, uh, without explicitly telling them that this content is or is not misinformative. Or providing people with more educational resources. For example, Facebook had a 
COVID-19 Information Center. Uh, and until late 2020, this was Facebook's approach. These soft interventions were widely considered to be uh, a good middle ground, or at least a middle ground, uh, between content removal on one extreme and doing nothing on the other extreme. Uh, but of course, uh, Facebook uh, changed their policy uh, starting in early 2021, where they have community standards where they said that they would remove misinformation uh, when public health authorities concluded that it was false and li likely directly contribute to the risk of imminent physical harm. So actually already as early as January 2020, Facebook said that they would remove very obvious misinformation, things like uh, taking more vitamin C would prevent COVID. Uh, but in practice, this was a very minimal uh, effort compared to what happened later. Uh, and so... Uh, Later on, you know, as we got, uh, you know, later in the pandemic, Facebook committed to removing false information that uh, was about the existence or severity of COVID-19 uh, or about its transmission or immunity, uh, as well as other sorts of uh, discouragement of uh, essential health practices. Um, and then the policy uh, uh, was really quite detailed, um, where they uh, include uh, ultimately, removing pages, groups, and accounts that share content that could be interpreted as sensational or alarmist vaccine content, uh, criticizing the choice to receive or provide vaccines, promoting alternative uh, alternatives to vaccines or promoting vaccine refusal, or shocking stories. Now, these categories can be interpreted as quite wide. Um, and by the time uh, this study was conducted, these were the policies that Facebook had in effect. And so the timeline here really goes through what it was that Facebook chose to do with uh, in August 2020, Facebook uh, really taking what had been an up to that point reasonably unprecedented step of actually removing accounts. Uh, in this particular case, they removed QAnon accounts that called for violence. And then on October 2020, they banned QAnon entirely. Uh, and under this QAnon ban on November 18th, 2020, Facebook removed a large page called Stop Mandatory Vaccination because it violated their QAnon policy. Now, Stop Mandatory Vaccination was one of the largest vaccine refusal uh, pages on the platform. And just two weeks after this was removed for violating QAnon policy, Facebook committed to removing COVID vaccine misinformation on December 3rd. And by February 8th, 2021, the policy was expanded in general to removing uh, general vaccine misinformation, not just COVID vaccine misinformation. So this timeline here between 20, uh, at November 18th, 2020 and February 8th, 2021 was a period during which Facebook's policy evolved and became increasingly focused on vaccination. And of course, after February, 2021, they continued to, uh, uh, to change their policies to uh, to target vaccine misinformation. But the key point being that this November 18th, 2020 um, policy over here really marks a shift between soft interventions beforehand targeting vaccines and harder interventions targeting vaccines. Uh, so in order to study the efficacy of their policies, we started out with a list of vaccine keywords. Uh, these are the same keywords that we used from prior studies on Twitter. Uh, and these included uh, all sorts of variations of the word vaccine, uh, as well as the word jab. Uh, but we excluded uh, anything containing uh, content about pets because the uh, universe of pet vaccine uh, discourse on, on Facebook is quite large. Anybody who wants to, for example, buy livestock, uh, it'll report on whether or not that livestock is vaccinated. We also removed the word gun because even though the word shot wasn't in our inclusion keyword, it tends to occur. And so removing the word, you know, anything pertaining to guns uh, makes sure that talking about shots is really referring to vaccines. Um, and so uh, what we did here on November 15th, 2020, we didn't know that Facebook's policy was coming. We sort of got lucky, but we we started collecting data on November 15th, 2020, uh, identified a very large set of pages and groups with posts that contained at least one of these keywords, and then excluded all of those that didn't generate the top 1% of those posts. Uh, and so that left us with a set of roughly 1,000 pages and 750 groups routinely discussing vaccination. Uh, we removed those that didn't 
discuss vaccination more than 20% of the time. Uh, and so uh, that left us uh, with a set of 114 anti-vaccine pages and 92 anti-vaccine groups on one hand versus 102 pro-vaccine pages and eight pro-vaccine groups uh, on the other hand. Uh, we excluded those that had been manually annotated as other. Uh, and then we actually repeated this process on uh, July 28th, 2021, and got a separate sample of uh, anti-vaccine pages and groups and pro-vaccine pages and groups for replication purposes. Uh, so the question here ultimately is, did Facebook's policy work? And for uh, asking this question, we used what's called a comparative interrupted time series design with ARIMA modeling. ARIMA is autoregressive integrated moving average. Uh, the basic idea here was we wanted to compare whether changes in the anti-vaccine pages and groups were significantly different from changes in the pro-vaccine pages and groups, with the idea being that, well, they're both talking about vaccines, so things like the news cycle about vaccines should, in theory, affect them equally. But Facebook's policy was only targeting anti-vaccine content, and so that should only target the anti-vaccine pages and groups. So if we see a significant difference, we can, with some reasonable confidence, attribute that to the uh, to the anti-vaccine policy. Uh, and what we see is that indeed Facebook's pages did uh, did uh, seem to overlap with a significant decrease in the number of anti-vaccine posts in both pages over here and groups over here. The gray, uh, the the dot, the dashed line, and the gray bars here are the ninety five percent confidence intervals for the trend based on the pre policy, which is to say before November fifteenth, twenty twenty data. Uh, and then we compare that to the post policy when Facebook started to implement all sorts of different policies. And we see there was, in fact, quite a significant decrease compared to what we would have expected in the absence of that policy. Uh, so did Facebook remove content? Yes, they removed quite a bit of content. And this is a logarithmic scale. So here we're looking on the order of uh, 1,500 posts per week in our sample. And that's going down to, uh, you know, at its lowest point, almost 200. So quite a significant drop. Uh, and then even more so in groups. Um, but of course, uh, there were some perhaps unintended consequences here. Posts in pro-vaccine pages also decreased in volume, although nowhere uh, near the same magnitude uh, as the anti-vaccine. So perhaps there was some, uh, if you will, collateral damage here. Uh, now, the interesting thing to us uh, was that the engagements did not differ from the pre-policy trend. So if you look at the number of times people engaged, which is to say like or share or comment uh, on an anti-vaccine post before the policy, it was already decreasing. Uh, and that's to be expected because for any given set of pages or groups, people are constantly sort of migrating out, forming new ones. And so that's why we want to compare to the to the pre-policy trend rather than looking at the raw numbers. Um, but we see that that trend seems to have largely continued, although there is a qualitative decrease, it's well within the error bars. Uh, and then in groups, interestingly, although that decrease uh, again seems to be going on, we see a spike here in early 2022 where we're actually exceeding that pre-policy trend. Uh, so we didn't see any change in engagements, even though the number of total posts went down quite a bit. Um, and you might ask, well, it's still going down, right? Isn't that good? And you say, yes, of course, it's good that it went down unless new groups formed, unless there were other groups or pages to which people were simply migrating in this sort of a whack-a-mole manner that we've we've heard in other, other contexts. And in fact, that's what we saw. If you compare the sample that we collected in July, here are the pre-November uh, pages here are the uh, July pages, and we see that when Facebook implemented their policy, the um, the the pages that we saw in July actually started going back up to the policy pre-policy trends from the November sample, and we're sort of largely hanging out around uh, around what we would expect based on uh, on on our our ARIMA model, uh, and in groups all the more so. We see a big jump over here, such that the um, the July sample actually has uh, as much content as what we saw back at the beginning of 2020. So that decrease that we're seeing here in the uh, in the 2020 sample uh, is balanced out by an increase uh, 
in our second sample that we've seen. Uh, so don't take that decrease uh, as, as ground truth. That decrease simply means people are moving from one group to another. Uh, and we can see that in the second sample that we collected later in July. So that's not great. Um, and one might say, well, maybe the information that re that remained was less misinformative. One could potentially argue that, okay, Facebook implemented the policy, the volume of content didn't change all that much, but maybe the, um, uh, I'm sorry, the volume of engagements didn't change all that much, but maybe they removed the misinformative content and people were actually uh, engaging more with, uh, with higher quality content. So in order to answer this question, we drew on Ify News, which is one way of measuring misinformation. I want to put that, you know, be very honest about this. You know, Ify News links to to uh, low credibility URLs is is not by any means the the um you know the end all be all of, of measuring misinformation. It's one imperfect way of doing so. Nevertheless, it is widely adopted. And uh, if we get multiple different imperfect measures and they all largely agree then that gives us more confidence uh, in our ensemble. So we're going to present this as one of, uh, of, of a few different ways of measuring misinformation prevalence. Um, and what we see over here is that after Facebook implemented their policy, uh, posts became more, not less iffy. And this uh, was associated with more engagement. So if we look at the proportion of all of the URLs that contained a link to a low credibility source, uh, after Facebook's policy was implemented in this um, November timeframe, that's the black um, dotted line over here, we actually see that post became more iffy, not less. Uh, interestingly, there was a big drop here after this blue dotted line. And that blue dotted line corresponds to when Francis Hogan, the Facebook whistleblower, um, dropped a bunch of documents to the Wall Street Journal, uh, as well as to the SEC, uh, alleging that Facebook was not doing enough to control vaccine misinformation. Uh, interestingly, uh, the engagements did not change. Uh, they did increase in proportion with iffy content after Facebook's uh, policy was implemented. Uh, but the uh, the drop over here that we're seeing in the proportion of iffy content did not translate to a drop in the proportion of engagements. Um, and so that, uh, again, problematic, not great. Um, not only did Facebook's posts become um, on a proportional level more iffy, they also became more biased. And so if we look at media bias fact check scores, which are what we see over here, and we uh, we we can look at them on a scale from extreme left to extreme right, uh, as well as the proportion that contain um, content that is biased in some way, which is to say it has a clear either left-wing or right-wing bias, we again see an increase in overall bias in both uh, posts and engagements and the increase in posts we see in both pages and groups. And not only that, but we see that there is uh, movement to the right-wing in anti-vaccine content, movement towards the left-wing in pro-vaccine content. Uh, and we see that uh, in groups, this continues a significant drift that was already happening prior to Facebook's policy. Um, but especially in the engagements with this content, uh, the, the policy was associated with an, an acceleration of this trend. Uh, okay, so I already mentioned that this iffy content uh, was not the only, you know, the end all be all of measuring misinformation. So not only did we look at the content uh, and links to URLs, but we we conducted some topic modeling. Uh, in particular, we use structural topic models. The reason we use structural topic models rather than traditional topic models uh, is that it allows us to incorporate a comparison between anti and pro vaccine uh, groups and pages. And that comparison uh, allows us to do the sorts of time series analyses that we are, are interested in here. So we extracted several different topics. We we um, had a, an algorithm select the total number of topics. It came out to be 61. What I'm showing you here is every topic for which there was a significant difference after controlling for multiple comparisons. So you, you can have some confidence that these um, that these differences are are meaningful. They're not just due to uh, to phishing. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sort of dive into what specific topics increased compared to pre-policy trends and compared to pro-vaccine topics. 
So in pages, we saw significant increases compared to pre-policy trends in topics that alleged uh, sensationalized uh, adverse events. So, you know, bad outcomes from getting a COVID vaccine. And so these adverse reaction posts were things that, you know, where people were basically saying, well, you know, I took the, the COVID vaccine and it, you know, it sent me, uh, I, I got some really bad outcome. I got really bad rash. I, you know, I couldn't breathe, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and you know, this uh, these reports of these adverse reactions, these uh, sort of sensationalized stories, shocking stories that by Facebook's own policy, you know, should have been uh, not allowed, uh, increased not only relative to pre-policy trends, but also relative to uh, to the equivalent uh, uh, content that we would have seen in pro-vaccine um, pages. Uh, we also saw increased reports in uh, people uh, reporting hospitalization and death due to the COVID vaccine, uh, which we didn't see before. We saw increases in claims that vaccines damage your immune system and uh, increase, increases in claims that vaccines contained toxic ingredients. Uh, so again, all of these uh, in principle should have not been allowed by Facebook's policies. Nevertheless, we saw increases. Um, we also saw increases in several topics that were not explicitly banned, but nevertheless sort of set the stage for the overall um, information environment to become more hostile to vaccination. So things like celebrity doctors saying you shouldn't take the vaccine. We saw increases there. We saw increases in discussion of school mandates. And so now we're seeing um, uh, concerns about measles outbreaks here in the United States and some states even uh, uh, even passing uh, you know guidance, essentially saying, well, People should be allowed to go to schools if they're not vaccinated. We saw a, a sort of a preview of discussion about that during the time of the pandemic. We saw increases in discussion about vaccine mandates and opposition to those mandates. We saw increases in discussion of legal issues, uh, as well as discussion of alternative medicine. So this continues a trend that we saw already back in 2019 prior to the pandemic, where people were increasingly discussion, discussing vaccines, not in the context of the science, uh, which had been the trend prior to 20, uh, you know, 2019 or so, but increasingly the gist of vaccination is about, don't tell me what to do. It's about opposing perceived government overreach. And this is, uh, this is now a narrative that has become quite widely embedded uh, after uh, the COVID pandemic uh, really brought it to widespread public attention. Uh, and so the claim that I'm going to make here is that a lot of what we're seeing here, a lot of the ways in which misinformation purveyors uh, are able to continue doing what they're doing is actually a consequence of Facebook's architecture. Uh, so what do I mean by architecture? Well, Facebook has certain designed structures, certain built features that allow users significant flexibility to avoid attempts by the platform to control what can get posted. And so specifically Facebook has what in, we in systems engineering call a layered hierarchy. Uh, layered hierarchy is, you know, consists of three layers here. The layers are pages, groups, and news feeds. And I'll talk about each one of these um, individually. Uh, at the level of pages, we see lots of pages linking to one another by posting links to content in one another's pages. And the key thing about a page to keep in mind is that pages are fundamentally broadcast channels. Only a page administrator can post in a page. Now, anyone can comment on the post, but only the administrator can post in a page. And so it establishes a sort of a, uh, a, a, sort of a power dynamic. And we see pro-vaccine here in blue and anti-vaccine here in red pages that link to one another. And again, those links come from the administrators, not from the members. Uh, in contrast, we have a middle layer here consisting of groups and groups are discussion groups. If you're a member of a group, you can post in the group. Um, importantly, there's a hierarchical relationship because any page admin can make that page the administrator of a group. And that's something that is explicitly allowed for and designed into 
Facebook's architecture, which means that if a page administers multiple groups, it can post the same thing in all of those groups at the same time. And we can see things like this coordination happening where multiple groups post routinely post the same thing at the same time. Uh, and even though we've uh, we've seen attempts by Facebook to sort of clamp down on this coordinated behavior, we see uh, that that uh, this sort of behavior continues uh, even uh, after Facebook's policy was implemented. And then finally, at the lower uh, layer of our of our hierarchy over here, we have people's news feeds. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these one at a time. Um, so the first thing to keep in mind is that this is theoretically motivated work. Uh, according to uh, prior work that we've done on system architecture, a layered hierarchy is a specific type of information flow structure that affords flexibility and allows for the control of some complexity. So essentially what you're doing is you're giving the users of the system the ability to, uh, to do what they want to do. Uh, and that comes at the cost of being able to control what it is they're doing. And a layered hierarchy sort of strikes a balance between a very highly tree structured network like what we see over here, uh, and then a very you know unstructured network like what we see over here. Um, arguably, Twitter is more of of this unstructured network, uh, whereas Facebook has this layered hierarchy which allows for some degree of control, but not total control. Um, and so since Facebook is a layered hierarchy, again, we have these sorts of relationships that are just built into the structure. Only page admins can post in pages. Uh, all group members can post in groups. Pages can be group admins, and most people are not admins. And so what we see here is, you know, if you will, a class society, right, where, where page admins are the upper class, uh, group members are the middle class, and so the average person is sort of like the masses, if you will. Um, and uh, I will just briefly flash this up here is if you want to get into the math of why it is that these uh, these sorts of structures, you know, trade off flexibility for complexity. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that offline. We have a whole theory about that. Um, uh, I also want to briefly tip my hat to Jen Forrestal, who uh, wrote some excellent work in this space about how a systems architecture can actually encode power dynamics. Uh, with Facebook having uh, these explicitly incorporated class systems uh, into their design. Um, and so uh, that sort of inspired uh, a lot of, of what we're seeing here. So again, page administrators are Facebook's upper class. Uh, there is prior work looking at how these page networks build and what the implications are. But again, what I want you to take away from this is that these page administrators only constitute, you know, maybe perhaps a few hundred people a few hundred administrators, but those administrators have quite a large megaphone. What they can do is they can link to one another's pages or groups such that if Facebook, for example, were to nuke uh, or, or otherwise remove some set of anti-vaccine pages, those are the ones here in black, uh, well, it's quite easy by virtue of this network structure for the page admins to simply provide links to other pages that haven't been shut down and therefore drive their audiences to uh, to these other pages and groups. And so the key point being here, unless you kill the whole structure, you're not going to be able to control the flow of information. And that, uh, you know, that comes at significant, significant cost and risk for Facebook. Um, and in fact, what we saw was that the anti-vaccine page cluster was resilient to Facebook's policies. Even though Facebook, you know, implemented their policy here in November, what we see is that the content you know, the number of posts to other anti-vaccine pages went down and went back up and then went down and then went back up. And so there's sort of this whack-a-mole thing going on here. Um, in contrast, we have Facebook's middle class or group members, right? And group members are, uh, are groups that are engaging in discussion. But again, pages can but need not be admins of groups. And so what we see is that among the anti-vaccine groups and pages, there's quite a bit of this coordinated behavior. Uh, the, the pink links over here are, uh, are links between groups that formed after Facebook's policies uh, were implemented. Uh, the gray ones are those that existed before. And although the gray links no longer exist after the policy, these new pink links have been formed. And so essentially the network is rewiring to adapt to Facebook's policies, uh, whereas we see pro-vaccine groups 
largely not using this affordance, largely not engaging. Uh, and uh, whereas the uh, the groups that sort of pre-existed Facebook's policy use this sort of coordinated behavior and simply built new links between those pre-existing groups. Among the pro-vaccine groups, we see just new groups forming entirely. So the pro-vaccine communities, although they have a lot of linkages in the on the level of the pages, those page admins are not successfully building community around the pro-vaccine viewpoints in the same way that the anti-vaccine uh, pages are. The anti-vaccine pages seem quite successful at setting up groups, and then those groups are coordinating with each other in order to share coordinated content. And uh, the the thing that we see over here, again, these anti-vaccine groups appear resilient to Facebook's policies in the sense that we see the same kind of thing. There's a drop and an increase and a drop and an increase. Uh, and we see that across um, both pre uh, bo both the the um, the November sample and here is is what we see for the uh, for the uh, July sample and when we combine them again we see sort of this this common picture uh, and then finally uh, I want to focus here on the user profiles right because Facebook uh, the average Facebook user uh, interacts with other users through their news feeds uh, and here is where we can sort of get some insight into how uh, how anti and pro vaccine groups uh, differ in the ways in which they uh, they interact with their audiences. Uh, one of the things that we saw was that in 2020, um, Facebook tried to reduce the weight of the angry emoji. So in September 2020, uh, a report came out uh, in the Washington Post that described how uh, Facebook internally had made some judgments that the angry emoji was more likely to be associated with misinformative content. And so Facebook, realizing that this angry emoji was an indicator of misinformation, decided to reduce the weight of that emoji in their algorithm to zero, such that if a post got an angry emoji, it would no longer get promoted in the algorithm. The intent there was to reduce exposure to, to misinformation. In September 2020, Facebook actually did reduce that emoji to zero. And what we see over here um, is that anti-vaccine content simply pivoted to the use of other emoji, where pro, whereas pro-vaccine content did not. Um, and so what we see is that uh, the angry emoji uh, went down in prevalence in the anti-vaccine pages and groups um, across both samples, uh, and the use of other emoji proportionally went up. But in the pro-vaccine pages and groups, we saw no significant difference from what existed before. So somehow, uh, the anti-vaccine uh, content producers uh, were able to successfully elicit responses from their audience that made those content more likely to be promoted in users' news feeds, whereas the pro-vaccine audiences were not as successful in doing so. Um, so the key thing here is that this layered hierarchy is something that's, I, I don't want to say, I, I know I wrote words unique to Facebook. It's something that Facebook has that Twitter does not. Uh, Twitter doesn't have that same kind of hierarchy. Uh, and so arguably would have different architectural structures. And we, we have uh, ongoing work right now uh, examining whether Twitter's policy had the same sorts of impacts. Um, but the key point here is that social media platforms are a part of the built environment, arguably uh, serve as critical infrastructures. And by examining the architecture of these platforms, we can make predictions regarding what sorts of uh, policies by the platforms are likely to be successful and which ones are not. And using this theoretically motivated lens, we may be able to uh, to help inform governance of these platforms in some way. Um, and so what I would argue we're looking at here is the equivalent of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse. So the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was a watershed event uh, in civil engineering when, uh, when people realized that bridges had to have building codes in order to prevent them from oscillating uh, at a resonant frequency uh, in, in the face of weather. Uh, and in fact, after the collapse of this bridge, the, the US government required that all bridges built with federal funds had to be tested in a wind tunnel. Um, and so uh, the key point is that 
we have things like building codes that are informed by scientifically driven best practices for ensuring that our infrastructures serve us in a way that is safe and that takes into account perspectives from lots of different stakeholders, be it industry, be it government, be it municipal, local, uh, civil society organizations, et cetera. And there's a whole process for developing standards that we have uh, that helps us to be able to um, to govern these systems in a way that uh, that you know keeps these infrastructures safe. Um, and so the message that I'm going to leave you with here is that you know looking at this from the perspective of hard and soft remedies that are fundamentally about content is ignoring the architectural element of how we design social media platforms. And so the claim is we should move beyond hard and soft content remedies in order to characterize social media platforms in terms of their architectures, because those architectures can give us insights into which remedies are likely to have which kinds of impacts under what circumstances. And then given what we know, given a solid uh, scientific basis for governing different types of architectures, then we can start the process of establishing building codes and doing that in a way that's consensus driven and really takes into account all of the different voices at the table. So uh, I will leave you with that uh, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, David. Very interesting stuff. Um, yes, everybody, please uh, put your little Zoom clapping hands together. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll open up the floor for questions. Um, maybe I could start real quick. I know, I think Phil usually has some questions. Um, but uh, so I, th I think this idea is super interesting. Um, and it's taking, as you said, a completely different look. Um, and you, you talked a little bit about sort of like this, the layered hierarchy structure. But like, what to me, it seems like if you're, you're one of the things that differs between having sort of structural codes for platforms versus like a bridge, um, especially in the United States would be sort of like First Amendment, like you were essentially controlling kind of, you know, how information can flow, free speech. So how do you how do you think about that? Um, and, 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 you know, I think maybe you talked a little bit about it. Apologies if it, if it went over my head, but like what kind of structures do you think are sort of like the what we should be going for? Um, and then how does that limit, you know, like what platforms can look like and so, so what is it? Yeah, what does it look like, and and how do you think about kind of these sort of speech issues uh, in your in your platform here? Yeah. So, so first of all, I'll start out by saying I am I'm certainly not an expert on the the First Amendment, uh, and 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 the legal intricacies surrounding the First Amendment. Um, but the key the key point I think that we we want to um, you know, that I want to emphasize here is that a focus on the infrastructure is quite distinct from a focus on the content. So by focusing on the infrastructure, we're not saying this is good content, this is bad content, you know, you need to remove this content, you need to keep this content. Uh, that's that's explicitly what we're what we're not saying here. Um, and so by understanding the ways in which the structure uh, leads to certain types of uh, uh, certain types of behavior or or at least just mediates certain types of behavior, that gives us some insight into ways in which social media platforms uh, can be more or less successful in implementing their own policies. Now, whether those policies are themselves legal or not legal is is a, a question for for the lawyers to determine, right? But given that they are trying to implement the policy, if that policy, you know, let's just take a sort of a, a draconian situation here, where some you know hypothetical platform would say, well, we're gonna we're gonna remove all content that has to do with subject X, right? If that it's not gonna work because of the way the platform is structured, then the legal question is, um, you know, less relevant to the to the practical matter at hand. Um, and so I think that that's sort of the 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 message here is is what I'm trying to emphasize is that we need to really understand how the structure of the platform as it's designed uh, allows us to even have the discussion about content maybe the discussion about content is premature if we you know even if in our best efforts we we actually can't do what these platforms have set out to do 
because let's say you know let's imagine a, a, a scenario down the line where where a determination is made that uh you know some kind of content needs to be removed or downranked or whatever the case may be if you're making that determination and then the 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 platform is now under some obligation to remove that content and the design of the platform doesn't allow for that that would sure be helpful to know up front so that's kind of that's really? kind of the approach we're we're taking <clears throat> Uh, and again, you know, not weighing in one way or another as to what platforms should do. I'm trying to look at it from the perspective of what does the platform's design even allow it to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I guess you could also argue like it's um, thinking about structural design is less less heavy handed in terms of content moderation. So maybe less of a infringement on free, free speech, if you will. Um, I'll let Phil take over uh, and I'll just sort of work down. We've got a few hands here. So go ahead, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Matt and Caitlin for organizing the series as always. And thank you, David. Great talk. Really um, insightful as always. And when you think about structure, it could mean lots of things. Like, for example, we've thought a lot about the network structure and you know who follows whom and the influentials, who are the super spreaders and also how bad actors can infiltrate the structure and and communities and so on um but uh recently the trend with platforms is to uh, oh and it could also mean of course algorithms right uh, how things are ranked and prioritized so i think all of these things are important and very complex uh lots of different complex factors that interact with each other but recently a trend has been towards de-emphasizing the role of structure, at least in terms of the network, and emphasizing more the algorithmic piece. Um, you know, following TikTok success, all the major social media platforms are now uh, promoting feed ranking systems that are mostly based on recommendation. As Sandro, who's on the on the Zoom with us, he was just saying yesterday, it's like we're, we went from web one to web two and now back to web one. It's all, it's it's more like a search engine or a recommendation system that the social mm -hmm. part of it is less important. So how do you see that? Like uh, in terms of, of, of the question of structure, like is doesn't that mean that content becomes sort of more central again? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, this is one of those, one of those questions that, that, uh, you know, I I think I think about a lot. Um, you know, there's structure and there's structure, uh, and I think that uh, that first of all, when it comes to things like algorithms, um, you know, the jury is out right now in the research community on the role of algorithms. With some people, I think, having very strong uh, priors that algorithms really do drive uh, you know exposure and behavior. Uh, and you know, on the other hand, studies sort of coming out. Um, starting to suggest that they, that may not be the case, but but you know I would hardly call that definitive. You know, like the 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 research still needs to be carried out, and um, you know obviously social media platforms don't always make that um, don't always make that easy. Uh, but uh, that being said, uh, you know I think I distinguish between the structure and the architecture, and the reason why I'm using the word architecture as a different way of thinking about this than structure is because uh, to your point about how, you know, for example, Twitter is a very highly structured, you know, has a very highly structured network. Uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, we see sort of the small world effect. We see, you know, all of the, uh, you know, clustering that that we've learned about over the past uh, maybe 20 years uh, as to how these social networks get formed. That is certainly highly structured. It is not totally random, right? At the same time, I want to distinguish between that kind of structure and architecture, by which I mean a designed structure. So the fact that Facebook is set up to say, well, there are these things called pages, there are these things called groups, and then there are these things called accounts. And a page is allowed by the platform to be an admin of a group. And a group is allowed by the platform to be the place where accounts can interact. Accounts can follow pages, but they cannot post in pages. That is a design structure. And that design structure, uh, arguably, has some effect on the ways in which the platform may or may not be able to carry out its own policies. 
So the argument here is that we need to pay more attention to the design structure and that the design structure, you know, will by definite will differ between platforms. Um, you know, Twitter does not have that same structure. Twitter has a different structure. You know, uh, Reddit has a, yet a different structure. And, you know, so so the idea that we can look at all social media platforms as interchangeable, um, you know, is is uh, is something that I think is worth interrogating. You know, can we or can we not? And what are some ways in which the design structure might then change, for example, the actual, you know, empirical structure? that might then also change um, the ability of the platform to have any idea of what's going on on that platform, right? Because if I were, uh, you know, I, I don't know what goes on inside Facebook, um, but, you know, presuming that I had an interface kind of like CrowdTangle to try to understand what's going on inside inside the, the, uh, the, the network, well, that interface allows me to look for things like pages and groups and accounts. Um, Whereas Twitter may not necessarily have that. Twitter may have a different interface by virtue of how it's designed. So I think um, we need to we need to pay more attention to the design structure, and that's that's kind of I don't I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Bao, you're next. the talk, um, I think is a very unique lens to um, question the design of the system. And this is just a comment, uh, but uh, you show that anti-vaccine groups use the affordances of the class system very effectively. And one could say that it's sort of a reaction against a Facebook policy, but I wonder how much is caused and if it's inevitable by the financial incentive that has to do with big institutions with a lot of stake to push the anti-vaccine agenda, like for example, the Children Health Defense. I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Uh, and then, um, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, and then um, I wanna ask if you have a hunch on the structures of decentralized platforms and how that would affect moderation. Right, um, so, okay. Uh, so yeah, the question of, of financial incentives is a really interesting one. Um, and we do have some prior works kind of looking at how uh, you know, major organizations have used Facebook's ads ecosystem in the past uh, in order to 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 um, to monetize uh, you know some of the uh, uh, some of the anti-vaccine sentiment. Um, it's still an open question. You know, measuring monetization is hard because there's so many different ways to monetize. Right, one of them is posting ads. The other is getting clicks. The other is, you know, make people making donations. Uh, and the financial incentives are, uh, you know, certainly part of the ecosystem, but I would argue um, we need a lot more work on how to do that right. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the question of, you know, to what extent are these posts by people who are true believers versus people who are simply trying to 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 make money? Um, I think is a, uh, a really important question. I think it's a really, really important question. My prior is that is that it's probably both, you know, um, but uh, but it really depends, uh, I think, on on the specific circumstances as well. And I, I and you know, I'm certainly not going to rule out the possibility that some of the people in this ecosystem are 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 just you know in it to you know to to drive traffic to their sites and make money, um, but. Uh, this specific study can't really speak to that. Um, now, as far as um, uh, you know, decentralized platforms, I think there are a number of different decentralized platforms that uh, this is where you know I, I would say if only we had the data, we could do such cool things. Um, but of course, there are real concerns around getting getting data. You know, Blue Sky is super interesting because it's you know a Twitter clone, but you have more control in theory over what the algorithm ends up being, right? Mastodon <clears throat> looks on the front end a lot like Twitter, but on you know on the back end has this federated structure, which uh, which arguably has some architectural significance. Um, and so you know we have uh, you know if we were to take this theory of, of generic architectures. You know, seriously, we would expect that uh, a platform like Mastodon with that federated structure might allow for more control, um, but also might allow for less flexibility, um, or at least the flexibility might come at the cost of ad hoc, you know, complex connections in between servers. 
Um, so these are these are things that I think are worth exploring more. Um, and uh, yeah, I, ho I hope you'll agree with me that framing things in an architectural way allows us to ask these questions that previously we, you know, I, I think it was was largely taken for granted that, you know, well, social media is social media. And, and, and uh, you know, I think it's worth exploring whether different platforms with different architectures can be compared to one another uh, along those dimensions. So I, I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure if I did. Thank you. All right, Manita, I think maybe we have time for one more. Uh, thank you so much for the talk today. It was really interesting to see from the perspective of system architecture and, and the analogy that you made to building codes. Um, my question is more from the perspective of practical side. So when we think of a fixed architecture, um, the social media platforms that we already have are not fixed architecture, right? It's evolving along the time, different rules, different um, structures, uh, services. So I would think of it more as an evolving system. So when we were to think even design a code, it would be more on like reverse engineering thing and understanding how things have been made and coming with codes for them. So to me, it kind of feels a practically a difficult task to do, actually coming up with a system codes to design a new system. But what about the existing system which are evolving? So what are your thoughts on this the practicality aspect of this yeah. So, um, I mean, you're right that um, that social media platform architectures can and do evolve. Um, Jennifer Forrestal wrote a book called Designing for Democracy, where she actually describes how the, the architecture of Facebook changed over time. You know, uh, Facebook, when it first came out, was uh, was very much affiliated geographically with with specific schools. So I was part of this network, you know, the, the, the network for, say, MIT. Somebody else might be part of the network for Harvard. Somebody else might be part of the network for IU. And within your network, that essentially served the role as the group does now. And then eventually Facebook phased that out and then phased in groups and phased in pages. And so you're absolutely right. Those are changes to the architecture of the platform. Um, and those changes, according to this theory, should have architectural uh, and significance and significance for the ways in which misinformation might be shared and ways in which one might be able to... Uh, uh, to 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 get some handle on that misinformation. Um, uh, now that being said, uh, the rate at which those changes happen is much much slower than uh, than the the average clock speed of your social media platform. And so you know one of the things that I would imagine Facebook's uh, leadership uh, probably spends a fair amount of time thinking about is if we're going to make this major architectural change, what are the consequences? Um, and so let's say for the sake of argument, you know, Facebook were to come under some pressure from a government, maybe the European Union, you know, or, or, or who knows, um, you know, to do something about misinformation. Do they know that changing the architecture might have implications for their ability to comply with, for example, the DSA, the Data Services Act? Right. And if the answer is, well, that's not something that they've been looking at or that's not something that they have systematic evidence for, then the question here becomes, can we as the research community provide that sort of systematic evidence so that the platforms themselves could then be in compliance with these with these uh, uh, these these newly emerging uh, governance uh, structures? Uh, and for that matter, let's say uh, Facebook and Twitter and uh, well X and um, you know uh, various other platforms uh, should choose to uh, uh, to engage in a in, in a voluntary process uh, that involves uh, you know in some way um, trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, come to grips with this problem of of misinformation it may not even be misinformation it may be illegal content right let's let's step back from misinformation which which clearly has uh, all sorts of, um, of of first amendment issues let's talk about you know content involving human trafficking which is clearly prohibited right um you know if if these different platforms want to get a better handle on how to how to control this content 
how to how to comply with relevant laws, uh, then the question becomes: How can we incentivize uh, the uh, the adoption of evidence based, data driven, uh, you know, policies that can that can help these platforms better to comply with these laws? Um, and you know, all of this putting aside, you know. Any any platform will of course want to do uh, you know want want to comply with the laws to the extent is feasible. Um, now it may be that there's more feasible than uh, than has previously been believed, and so there's I think real scientific value here in helping us to understand what's feasible uh, and the ways in which platform architecture might actually drive uh, you know drive that that feasibility. Um, so I do think that there's several significant practical implications. The architecture of a platform is mutable, can be changed, but largely, you, you know, you don't want to keep changing it all the time. You want to do it, uh, you know, every so often, maybe once every, say, five or 10 years. Um, and you want to be aware of the consequences of those architectural choices, uh, such that when those choices are made, you don't get caught by surprise. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you, David, uh, so much for all your time. We're a few minutes over here, so um, we'll have to call it. But um, yeah, thank you again for a really interesting presentation. Um, and uh, I think we all learned a little bit. So uh, yeah, bye, everybody. Thanks again for another awesome speaker's talk. <laughs> Take care.